Hello YouTube, it's Cecropia1999 here, and today I'm going to be doing kind of a general care slash general information video on this beetle species right here, which is Phalurus truncatus, or the Triceratops beetle. And one of the reasons I wanted to make this video was because there's a lot of confusing information about the species that I've seen online. And I have a lot of experience rearing this species, though I haven't been too successful breeding it, and I just thought I'd make an informational video uh, for you guys. So, um, the first thing I like to look at is how to tell them apart. Um, as some of you may know, um, unlike most rhinoceros beetle species, both the males and the females of Phalurus truncatus have horns. So they're quite a bit trickier to tell apart than, say, the eastern Hercules beetle or the ox beetle or something like that. So, um, if you look closely at the Triceratops beetle, here's a really nice good view of it. Uh, look at the horn structure. And for males, this is a male right here. Notice how the horns point backwards. You can see that they have little nubs on the top of them, and they are pointing directly backwards towards the rest of the, the beetle. That is characteristic of a male. Um, whereas if you look at the female here, notice how the horns are much straighter. They're much thinner, and they point straight upwards. Now let's look at the male again. Again, see how they're much stockier, the horns are, and they point backwards? Compare that to the female. Right there. Much thinner, points straight upwards or out in front. One more time. Male, pointing backwards. Also, if you look at the size, um, males typically tend to be smaller than the females by a little bit. Uh, which, yeah, you can sort of see right here. Um, another interesting thing about the species is that they do make noise. They do stridulate. Let's see if I can get one to do it right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah. They do make noise. Um, and a lot of people have told me that they found the species particularly uncommon, which has always surprised me because of all the rhinoceros beetles I've raised, I've raised more of these than and had more of these than any other species um and i think part of the reason why people think they're so uncommon is because they're looking in the wrong places for them they're looking for these beetles as if you, you would look for maybe a stag beetle in the wild or um an eastern hercules beetle and before i say any any more um i do want to point out that these guys will come to lights Absolutely, like most other big scarab beetles. However, I've had m my greatest success finding these in large numbers, actually finding them in the daytime, and I'm going to tell you how I look for them. So um, I've noticed these are particularly abundant in tall, dead trees in predominantly rural areas. Like if you see a dead um, oak tree or dead elm tree or dead ash tree, though I've had more successes with oaks and oaks and elms uh, sticking straight up from like a field um, and if you start peeling away the bark a lot of times there'll be holes underneath the bark pretty deep holes um, and these usually occur um, eight to ten feet off the ground or so and I found almost all of my adult specimens in the wild in those holes uh, including larvae as well so they, they're not in like a tree cavity close to the ground like you may find in overwintering Dynestes tidius or in a log like you may find, you know, something like Dorcas brevis, a stag beetle species. They're usually 8 to 10 feet off the ground um, under bark in these, these rotten tree cavities. Um, and oftentimes you'll find a ton of grubs all at the same age too. Um, I know I think my personal record is 30 grubs of these guys at one time in one tree hole, about 10 feet off the ground over in northeast Georgia. And, um, and they were all, they were all uh, third instar larvae as well, so they didn't take too long to, uh, to reach adulthood. Um, but what's also interesting about the species is that the female will actually watch over the, the grubs. So in the pod of 30 grubs that I found, I found one adult female as well uh, with that nest. Um, and um, that, that's how I found the greatest number of them in the wild. It actually hasn't been blacklighting, surprisingly. 
Um, so I'm kind of want to go over how you take care of the species. So I just want to let you know that I've never had success breeding these guys in captivity. Um, but I have had success rearing the larvae to adulthood. Um, so the larvae, uh, found them all in tree cavities. I've never found a single one in a rotten log on the ground. And, um, the larvae are in oftentimes in a big clump, like you'll find 30 at one time or 12 at one time. And I've noticed that the composition of the substrate in the tree hole that I found them in is a little bit drier than, say, where you'd find Dynestes titus larvae or especially stag beetle larvae. Stag beetles, especially in the southeastern U.S., like it uh, quite wet. Um, and they seem to be able to be kept together. Um, now, I do not keep the adult female that I may find with those larvae um, in the wild with the larvae in captivity. And I've done that once, and the female ends up eating ends up eating the larvae because these beetles are strictly carnivorous, which I'm going to talk about later when we get to the adults. Um, yeah, so so remove the female from from the rest of the larvae if you happen to find a nest with a female and a bunch of larvae. And then... I would keep two larvae per 32 ounce deli container. And the reason why I keep two larvae is because these beetles all pupate, I've noticed, at the exact same time, almost to the day, which is just very strange to me who's been rearing uh, rhinoceros beetles for a long time. But that's just what they seem to do. And I wonder if it's almost like an um, offer some sort of evolutionary advantage because they are all carnivorous. So think about it. If one reached adulthood sooner, they might actually, you know, cannibalize the fellow pupae that's next to it. So they all pupate on pretty much the same day, and they all emerge one right after another, which is really kind of cool. And the entire life cycle from um, really egg to adulthood is surprisingly short for rhinoceros beetles. Um, anywhere from 12 to 18 months is what I'd say. And that's just to get to the adult phase. Uh, the adult phase itself is... They they live for about uh, a pretty pretty long time uh, two and a half years actually as an adult. Um, yeah, um, as far as substrate for the larvae, uh, pretty much just whatever you find them in um, in the tree hole. That that's how I've just raised all mine. Though they, I've noticed they do like a high leaf concentration compared to some of the other rhinoceros beetle species. Uh, that I've had, or that you can also find in the United States. Um, now, I've mentioned before that these adults are strictly carnivorous, and that is true. Um, they will not take beetle jelly in captivity. Um, they will not take fruit. They definitely won't take any type of fruit. So what do I feed them? Do I just go outside and collect large dead insects um, for them to eat all the time? Well, no, that, that's just not very practical. So I found out that feeding them hot dogs actually works really well. Uh, so this is just a frozen hot dog that I've thrown in here. And um, they seem to love them. Um, I've had them live almost three years just eating straight hot dogs. Um, now you notice this is kind of an interesting contraption I've made at which to feed them. And I'm kind of going to go over why I did that. Um, and it's because these beetles will take the hot dog off. If you just leave it on a plate, they'll they'll just take the hot dog, bury it. It'll get moldy. It'll rot. It'll smell. You'll never be able to find it. You'll have a major mite infestation, and it's just going to be a big mess. So if you put it on a toothpick and then kind of put it in this little cup, the beetle isn't going to drag this cup around, and it's not going to be able to pull the hot dog off. So that's how you get them from from burying the hot dog and and you know leading to a big moldy mess. Uh, also, the containers I keep them in are these little salad containers. Now, here's my hand for comparison. You notice that this isn't very big for such a, a, a relatively large North American beetle. And again, there's a reason for this. It's because, one, they don't need a lot of space, which is what I found, compared to some of your other larger, um, larger U.S. beetles. Um, and also, if in the event they do happen to run off with their food, you don't have a big area to search for it in here. So the chances of you not finding it and leaving it to get moldy and smelly and disgusting are much are much less. Um, 
If you do want to feed them insects from the wild, let's say you don't want to do hot dogs, uh, feel free. Um, I've done that for a while too. Um, they will eat, uh, I, I know I've fed them freshly killed cockroaches or freshly killed grasshoppers or freshly killed mealworms. Um, they will eat those, no problem. The only thing is, is you need to make sure that they're dead or close to death because they're not fast enough to catch them uh, by themselves. But all around, they're just a complete oddball as far as uh, U.S. rhinoceros beetle species go. Um, they're carnivorous. I think they're the only strict carnivorous rhinoceros beetle species in the U.S. Um, their life cycle is obscenely short. It's just, I should say, they're, the amount of time it takes for them to reach adulthood is very short. It's just 12 to 18 months. Um, and just their entire behavior, all pupating at one time, um, I mean, finding 30 at one time in one tree hole, 8 to 10 feet off the ground, all this is just very unusual behavior. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the video on my, the other video on my YouTube channel of them actually eating a hot dog, but if you want to see, if you think I'm just making this all up, um, I do actually have a video from a couple years ago of them doing so. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to shed some light on this species, which is kind of an oddball all around, and I feel like there's not a lot known about it. Um, I wish I could give you more information about breeding-wise, uh, except I just have not been successful. Um, but yeah, this is Phalurus truncatus, one of the strangest rhinoceros beetle species you'll ever see. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope I was able to give you some good insight into, into taking care of the species.